Morning, everybody, and welcome to the show. How you doing, buddy? Good. Ready Good to get started? Oh, yeah. Today we're going to be working on a 2019 Honda Accord. One of the unique features of the Honda Accord is something that a lot of cars are starting to move to, and that is the floating screen in the dash. We're starting to see that in the aftermarket side as well. We have a few manufacturers that are producing floating radios like this that'll allow you to retrofit your car to look like one of these newer cars. And this style radio does pose a few challenges for us in the aftermarket world. For one, we're not going to be replacing out this radio. It's got to stay. It's part of the car. All the data in the car passes through this radio. Air conditioning, drive control, gas. Pretty much anything that you're going to be doing in the car is somehow going to be integrated into this touchscreen. So what that means for us is that we're going to be integrating into the factory systems in this car. So we're going to have a lot of testing we're going to have to do to do that. But before we get to that point, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing in this car for this particular customer because he had a certain set of requirements that were important to him. Right off the bat, he wants base because there is no subwoofer in here. It didn't come with the factory one. He's also got two kids, which means double the amount of fun that he takes with him. So he doesn't want a big box enclosure. He's also got this plastic floor mat in here that he wants to keep. We've talked on the phone about a couple of options and one of the things that he would like to do in this car is a subwoofer that is down firing so that he can still put stuff on top of it and is a small footprint. So when it sits in the trunk, it's not gonna take up a ton of room and he can move it wherever he needs to in case he has to put kid stuff in the back, which he does frequently. The other thing is he really doesn't want to see any of the equipment. There's no room underneath where the spare tire is because it has a full spare tire that, of course, he still wants to be able to get to. We talked about putting it on one of the side panels here, up here somewhere, or over here. He wasn't too keen on that idea and really wants to put it somewhere that's totally out of the way. After doing a little bit of looking around in the car, what we come up with is this area here underneath the passenger seat. There's a lot of room here. There is some vents that come out from underneath. The floor mat tends to stick underneath it a little bit. The seat sits on these risers here, which means that we can build a panel that suspends itself over this, allows the airflow to still come out, and mounts the amplifier firmly up underneath the seat and keeps it tucked in out of the way. Because of that space being a premium, we're gonna go with an integrated DSP amplifier. That is an amplifier that has all the processing, all the inputs, all the things that we're gonna need to integrate into this factory stereo already built into it, so we don't have any other equipment we have to hide somewhere in the car. It'll streamline the installation process just a little bit. Because we are gonna be doing a DSP in the car, we're gonna be doing time alignment. That means that we're gonna need some information from the customer, specifically his size and where he's sitting in the car. Very important that you have this in order to do time alignment. Sometimes we're fortunate and the customer is still here and it allows us to get those measurements beforehand. And what we're looking to do is figure out where his head is in relationship to all the speakers in the vehicle. Now when doing these measurements, what you want to do is measure from here to the cone of the speaker. Now keep in mind, the speakers are in the door panels. What you want to do is add about two and a half inches to your measurement so that you can compensate for that. In this case, we're just going to be doing a set of components up front that are going to be passive, meaning we're going to be using the crossovers that come with those components. When doing time correction, the preferred method is to do active. In this case, we're just going to be measuring to the mid-range. We do this a lot and we've had great success with how it turns out. So once we get the measurements done, we're not putting away the tape measure quite yet. That just got us a little bit of a head start at the end of the installation. One of the other things we do is we measure the location of the seat. We have several key points that we do that on. And the reason we're going to do that, as we're doing the install, this seat is going to move. So we have wiring that's going to be running along this panel or maybe running along this panel. We want to be able to put the seat back in the same location it was when he brought it in. Now, if we're lucky, it'll have seat memory on it and we don't have to worry about it. But in this case, this car does doesn't. What that means is that we're going to take several different measurements for this install. We want to know how far it is from the steering wheel to the base of the headrest, how far it is from the bottom of the steering wheel to the crease in the seat, the headrest to the ceiling, front of the seat to the gas pedal, the bottom of the seat to the floor, both front and back, from the bottom of the back of the seat to the ceiling, as well as the front of the seat to the ceiling. That way we can move this back in to the exact position it was. We also gauge on how big the customer is when he's sitting in the car because we need to still be able to tune the car. As you saw, he is a tall gentleman. We'll have to make sure we shim ourselves up in the seat so that when we're listening, we're at about his head height. 
anytime we bring a car into the install bay before we start our installation, we want to protect as much of the interior as possible. We also place carpet over the armrest. If there's a gear shifter, we have a gear shifter boot, and the steering wheel, of course, gets covered as well. The idea is to keep the car as safe as possible while we're working on it. If there's any panel that's going to be removed or anything that could possibly get scraped, we also cover it in tape a couple different layers to make sure that nothing will happen to that. Because we'll be working on the battery here up underneath the hood, we also want to make sure we protect the side of the vehicle and any other area that we're going to be working on. What we want to do at this point is figure out what this factory stereo is doing to the car. Not the RTA yet, we don't need to know that, but what we want to do is check polarity. We want to see if the factory has anything in or out of polarity relative to the other speakers in the car. For example, is this tweeter in polarity with this mid-range? There's also back tweeters in the very back corners, which we're going to negate, but we want to see what's going on back there as well. This particular vehicle doesn't have a factory subwoofer, and what that probably means is it has a base model system, meaning there's no exterior amplifier. But we'll talk about that more as we proceed through the install. To do polarity check, you need the polarity popping sound. Basically, it moves the speaker and there's a tool that will read that. We have multiple versions of this depending on what the car has. In this case, this car does not have a CD player anywhere in the car. It works strictly off of the USB because this car has CarPlay. To do our polarity test, we will be using a phone that has the track recorded on it. To test for polarity, there are apps that you can download on your phone. However, we are gonna be using our phone to generate the polarity, so we'd have to have a long enough cable to move it around to each speaker. There are tools you can also buy as well, and that's our preferred method. I'm a collector, I like to collect tools, and I have a collection of polarity tools. We have all different styles depending on the situation. This tool here, the PT9A, will generate a test tone, both aux and over test leads. It has a microphone in the tip here. This one here is very similar to it. This is a select products version. This is a, a wand style that you just put up next to the speaker and it lights up green and red. And this does the same thing as well. Go ahead and play the test track. The speaker is going to make a popping sound. We can put our tester to it. And this track puts out a green, green, red pop, which we're seeing here. The tweeter is doing green, green, red. We'll move on to the mid bass. Mid bass is doing green, green, red. We'll check the rear of the car also. Check the far tweeter. Now that we've done that check, we know that all the speakers in the car, tweeters in mid-range, are all moving in the same direction. Nothing that is reversed to its counterpart. Knowing that information at the beginning saves us a little bit of time at the end while we're moving through the car. One of the things that we talked about in this install with this particular customer, he's worried about rattle. He realizes that there is going to be a certain amount of vibration in the door and he wants to eliminate that as much as possible. We're going to do a sound treatment on his door. Now we offer a couple different sound treatments depending on your needs. In this case he's selected our premium sound treatment. And what that's going to consist of, the actual door panel itself, we want to go over any of the seams that the door panel has, make sure that they don't rattle. We're going to concentrate on the actual mount of the speaker as well as behind the speaker on this exterior of the door, which is where a lot of the rattle comes comes from. We're also going to be doing the rear deck. We do the back side of the rear deck completely along with the rear deck itself using a couple different materials along the way which we'll show once we get to that portion of the install. For speakers he is going to be doing a set of components up front as we said and a set of coaxials for the rear. Even though the rear is a factory component set he really didn't see the need to do that because he's not super excited about rear fill. He does have kids that are going to sit back there but most of the time they have their headphones in and they're listening to their own thing. He just wants it for the effect. When doing a system like this, if you look at it on a sheet of paper, it seems pretty simple. It's all a five channel amp, set of components up front, coaxials in the rear, and a subwoofer. That's really about it. Reality is though, it's a much bigger process. Installing that amplifier, it's a full DSP amplifier and it has to integrate with a factory stereo. We're doing sound treatment on the doors. Very time consuming process. Time management is crucial when doing a job like this. We have a certain amount of time in which we need to finish it. Once we're even done with it, we're not technically done with it yet. We still have a couple hours in which we have to sit in the car, what I like to call debugging, testing, and tuning. Getting a plan from the get-go together and starting on it is important 
important. One of the things we do right when a car comes in, along with all this testing, is we spend a couple minutes going over the criteria of the car. Now we need to spend some time going over with my partner, Fernando, what he's gonna be responsible for and what I'm gonna be responsible for. That also means where he's gonna be at in the car relative to where I'm gonna be at in the car. He's gonna start on the sound treatment. We do have to go over what's actually going in the car because although I've been telling you, I've been neglecting him. We're gonna do our premium treatment package. We wanna make sure we cover all the joints on here, do this focus here, and then of course get the whole inside skin of the door panel as much as possible. We're not doing the back doors because there's no speakers in here, but we are gonna do the rear deck. Okay. Let's put select on the top. We're putting the Tempo Ultras in here with fast dreams. We'll have to figure out where we can put the crossover. As far as integration goes, I have to get the dash apart and figure out what's going on there. We're gonna be mounting the base knob in underneath that USB. Everything is gonna go underneath the passenger seat. Okay. So what I'm thinking is we'll build a floating amp rack off of the floor so that the mat still goes underneath it, which will also allow the heat and air to come out. He lives in North Carolina, not here in Florida. We wanna make sure that still functions. And then power wire coming to this uh, yeah, driver's side. Power wire will come through the driver's side. Okay. Unless there's a hole in the firewall, which I haven't checked yet. There, there is a giant grommet there. I have to get the glove box out because the ANC mics that we have to disable, I right. believe are below the airbag and above the glove box. Yes. I think on the last one we did, that's where it was at in the newer vehicle. So what I'm thinking is starting on the driver's door. Okay. Or the rear deck. I was thinking start. Well, I have to do all the testing, so I gotta get the radio out of the dash. I'm thinking we save that door for last once I go to start doing the amp rack. I think going in the natural transition, go one, three, four, and yeah. then come back to two would probably make the most sense. Okay. Just because I, I don't think there's anything I need to do on that in side that of the car. Side. Okay. And you're gonna have a couple hours on that. I don't think there's anything we need to pull apart on this side as far as flow rails go, because <clears> the <throat> subwire will go up the passenger side here. Correct, and then the signal yeah. Come up with a strategy as far as what we want to do. If you heard me say one, three, four, two, that's how we refer to the speaker positionings in the car. Driver one, passenger two, three and four are the rear. There again, it goes one, two, three, four. That is a pattern that we talk about anytime we're doing an amplifier, speaker locations, wiring on the radio. It's just something we've come up with to make it easier to understand it. instead of having to say passenger, rear, drivers, he's going to start on this door, getting it apart, getting me that factory speaker so we can figure out what kind of paneling we have to come up with because one of the things we're not going to do is chop up the factory speaker or anything hokey like that. If it needs a panel, we'll build a panel. Before we get started on this door, we want to talk about tools that you're going to need in order to perform set task. This is plastic, this is vinyl, it scratches super easy, so you need a tool that's not going to scratch it. You just don't grab a big flathead screwdriver like this and start going at it. Also, this is a panel clip remover. This is designed to go behind a panel and pull a panel out, not come at it from the front to pop it out. For that, you need something that's made out of a soft material that won't scratch the plastic. We have a couple different versions of it. This is a giant panel tool. The reason why this is cool is because in certain situations where you need a tool like this because of its strength, you can use this tool because of its strength. In finer detail work, we have these two guys here. The white is the softest of the two. If we're doing something that we're really scared of scratching, we use this tool because it can get in there and this will break, chip, or bend long before the plastic panel that we're taking out will. Then this guy here is one of my personal favorites because it's nice and rigid, it's very soft, and it can get into places further up in that a normal tool won't do. That's not to say we don't still have a bunch of the little blue ones because those are specialty. They can get in and do a lot of neat things. Now, there is one other test we do, but we had to wait until we get the driver's door panel off in order to do that and that is testing for ANC or automatic noise cancellation some people call it fake engine noise there's a ton of different names for it but basically it does one of two things one in the case of what Honda usually likes to do is it pumps in noise that is designed to kill cabin noise think of it as like a set of noise canceling headphones but in the whole car the second is if you have something like a v6 engine and the car manufacturer wants it to sound bigger and meaner then they'll pump in like a growl sound into the speaker Either way, all of them are a headache when it comes to adding a subwoofer, especially in the Hondas. Now, not all Hondas have it, and you want to test for it. What you're going to need is something like this, which is a handheld RTA. This is going to allow us to do, see the signal that's coming to the speaker, and as we rev up the engine or make noise in the car, it will react accordingly. The reason why we needed to wait until the door panel is off is so we can get to these front speaker wires in order to do the test. Put some test leads onto the negative-positive speaker wires here, and those 
those are gonna get plugged in. Next, you wanna get into the vehicle, roll up all the windows. That's important because controlling the windows actually will turn it on and off. Make sure the trunk is closed, make sure the seat is folded up. Connect the RTA and rev it up. That's something you don't wanna see. That means that there is ANC in this particular car. Now another telltale sign for it is usually there's microphones in multiple locations in the car, such as up here by the handles. Usually there's one in the back somewhere. Depending on your make, model, and car, there are certain ways that they can be disabled. Usually in the Honda Accords, there is a silver box that just gets unplugged and it shuts the whole thing down. In some other vehicles, you actually have to go into the programming of the car and shut it off. Some of them it's just as simple as going to the microphones and unplugging them. Each car manufacturer likes to torture us in their own specific way. The reason why we use this particular RTA, this one does not have a microphone that is actually active on it. And the reason why is you can pick up noise over that microphone that mimics ANC. Most customers are not even aware of this. So when you tell them, oh, your car has, they're like, what? I don't, I don't hear that. And that means it's working because you're not supposed to know that it has it. Well, what happened if we didn't disable that in this particular car is that every time they go to accelerate, you saw how that was in the low frequency band. The subwoofer would try to reproduce that. And then the car would try to counter that and then it would get louder. And eventually what happens is it just rails up until the point to where the subwoofer just sounds like it's gonna explode. That's also a dead giveaway the car has it. You don't wanna get to that point. You wanna make sure before you start that you know as much as you can. This will also save us time in the end and possible headaches. Let's take a look at the factory speaker. It uses a small neo magnet made out of a composite material. It screws in with one hole here and it clips in the bottom. It attaches like this, snaps into place, one screw done. The speaker we want to put in its location is this guy here. It's a little bigger and a lot deeper. That means it's just not going to sit in the door, screw in, and be nice and easy. We have to come up with a mounting system that takes this and fits it into this location. Let's head over to the door and just set this into the hole and see what that looks like. Because of those two clips they've built this funny shape into the door and that's where these go in and it's got this clip in bolt system here that just pops out and this of course is perfectly round the other thing too is the window going to sit right about there so if we just set this in right here i can see i'm touching the window it's going to need about an inch to come out of the door if we do space it out an inch that's kind of nice because this at an inch doesn't get in the way it might get in the way of the actual door door panel. If we look at the factory speaker again, it's about an inch and an eighth deep, plus it has another quarter inch piece of foam and a hard piece of plastic on it, making it about an inch and a half. The surround sits in about an eighth of an inch. That means we have plenty of room coming out of the door. The basket comes out about an inch. With the surround here at an inch and three eighths, puts this right at the same as the speaker. That means I think the simple solution for this is to just make a panel that spaces this speaker out an inch. We'll roll the window down and just double check. With this at one inch, it clears the window by about a quarter of an inch. We have nothing to worry about. This window also doesn't move any, so we don't have to worry about any window swing. It's a newer car, I didn't think we would. One of the things we do have is this guy right here. This is to add a speaker to the Hondas. It's only a half inch thick though, but it's designed to mount the same way. It has the same clips in the bottom. It allows you to put a screw here in the top and it'll snap into place. Our speaker will also fit in this mount, but it's just not tall enough. But that does give us an idea. We basically just need this same shape, but we need it an inch thick. We also need some way to attach it to the door. These clips, though, are really cool for this light weight speaker this speaker weighs a lot more and is going to be moving a lot more too we're going to get a lot more bass out of this speaker than we were getting out of this one being able to copy this shape and just make it bigger does seem like a good idea so we can use this for our template we want to take this to an inch to fabricate that we're going to use this stuff here it's called center it's a blown pvc we're going to cut four of these out and stack them on top of each other to get them to the desired depth that we need for those speakers Stack two of these on top of one another. So we use a thin double-sided tape to do that, also known as template tape. I 
we'll go ahead and cut off any excess tape that is around here. We don't want it to get gummed up into our router bearing. Because we are gonna be using both inside and outside of this template, we'll drill a hole in the center. Before I get started, I like to check my bearings to make sure that they haven't seized up from the time before. Just roll them to make sure that they're still spin and that there's nothing on the bearing. We also wanna check the height to make sure that we have ample clearance all the way around because we're gonna be going inside and out. As far as that goes, I like to start with the inside first and then move on to the outside. That way I have a bigger piece to hold on to while I'm doing that and then a smaller piece in the end. One of the things I didn't mention before we started is in that bearing. If we notice right here, there's this notch. If the bearing is too high, it's gonna eat that up. So you wanna make sure when you're doing it, you check all sides, kind of do a general like looky round. Before we make the second one, we'll go ahead and pop this one off and do a test fitting to make sure that it actually fits. This speaker does have a logo and you may or may not be able to see it through the door. But what that means is this panel is going to attach to the door. The speaker is going to attach to the panel. We don't want to put the screws where they're going to get in the way of each other. There's a hole here from the factory that we're not going to be reusing. For mounting it, we're going to mark our screw holes in the top down left right position and we'll use these corner spots here to mount this to the door. Let's go take it over to the car and double check. All right, so this fits perfect. Pull it back apart. The tape is not made to hold this thing in place. And though the screws once put in will hold it in place, we're just gonna put a quick bead of CA glue on here to hold these two together. Move it around just a little bit to make sure you get the glue everywhere it needs to be. Now CA glue requires an activator in order to have it stick together. For this, we'll be using the aerosol. We'll let it set for a couple minutes to dry and then we'll drill our holes. One of the things working with plastic is you should always drill your holes. Don't just drill right into it. It doesn't like that. We'll pre-drill the holes that the speaker is going to screw into. And then we'll put some bigger holes that the bolts that are going to pass through will screw into. We need this to be perfectly flat on the top. So we'll also add in a little countersink here. We want to make sure that we went in deep enough for these to fit in and we did because we want to make sure like I said that this is perfectly flat on here. How we're going to fasten these in the door is we're going to use these guys right here. This is called a nut cert and it's basically a rivet. This area here is designed to crush. They thread into a tool and then once the tool is applied it crushes them into the metal. And what that gives you is a screw in that is reusable. So you can screw it in and unscrew it as many times as you want. Makes servicing the vehicle super easy if need be. And of course it looks a lot nicer than just putting a drywall screw or a self tapper into the vehicle. So nut certs have become super popular. And for this installation, we're gonna use this guy here, which is a pneumatic version of it because we can easily get to it. It's in a door. However, there are some situations we wanna use it that this obviously won't fit into. For that, we have this here, which is designed to attach the end of a drill. This gives us length, so if we need to go down into an engine bay or over into a side panel or we just generally need reach, we can use this guy here. In some applications, we don't have a lot of height. We need to get in like this and squeeze. And the most popular version is this one here. Put it in location and you squeeze and it'll apply the nut cert. Having a variety of tools that perform the same task just in different ways is helpful to make the installation the way we want it to be in the end. One last step that we want to do to this panel before we take it over to the car is apply a thin layer of foam to the back side of it. And I mean thin layer of foam. We use a 30 seconds of an inch foam on the back and front of all our panels that are going to attach to a car for a speaker. We've tried all different sizes. We ordered in eighth inch, sixteenth of an inch. And the problem we found is that speakers like this that are made out of a composite material usually are thinner than this of course, but they twist and they bow around where the screw would go in. Obviously that can't be good for the prolonged performance of the driver. So we settled on this size in order to avoid that. We're gonna just put it on the back first so that we can get this attached. And then once we go to add in the speaker, we'll add it onto here. Let's head over to the car and get this fastened. take our factory adapter here and we have a grease pencil. We want to just mark where this is going to end up. 
Now we can line up ours. And we just want to score where we need to drill holes. Thread the nut cert onto the gun. Push. And then back it out of the hole. Then repeat the process. And then slowly work your way around. Don't tighten them all the way all at once. We'll add in our piece of foam front of the speaker. Now the other thing I did when I was marking this for where I want the speaker to go, I put marks on tops and sides. That's to show where the hole is that we drilled. If we just had a mark on the front after putting the foam on, you'd never see it. The next thing we want to do is kind of a crucial step. We want to go ahead and screw the speaker in. Not permanently, but just screw it into place. The reason for doing this is so that we can put the door panel on and make sure that it clears and that the speaker isn't rubbing at all. So take a bright light and shine it into the door panel. And what you want to do is see where the mid base is. Now that you know that you're not going to have any hiccups once you're done with the door panel putting it back on, you could remove it back out. One other thing that we're going to add to this speaker is fast drain. If you'll notice here on this factory speaker, it has this layer of foam. And what that's designed to do is when it goes back into the door panel, it goes into a cavity. And this gasket allows all the energy that this little guy is creating to come through that grill. The speaker we just built, it doesn't have that. What we're going to be using is a product called a fast ring. It comes in three pieces that do three different things. The first piece is this front piece, and this is designed to mimic this gasket. It comes bigger than it needs to be so that you can actually cut this to length, because we're only gonna need this small amount here. Granted, we're gonna mount it to the door like this, so we'll cut it, and that'll help our speaker couple with the door panel. Then you have two back pieces. This one is designed to go into the door panel to help absorb vibration, and then this piece here is designed to focus that energy into the absorbing panel. Now, how these three pieces work, take this piece here and it's going to go in and stick to the back of the door panel here. The skinnier one is going to go in and mount to the inside of the door. There again it may need to be cut depending on where the window comes down and in this case it's going to need to be cut probably to about an inch. Then the front piece we're going to use to attach around the outside of our speaker bracket. You don't want to stick it to the outside of the speaker because if you have to replace the speaker, you would then have to replace the fast ring. It's foam, it easily stretches into place, and then you just keep wanting to push it until it gets onto the metal like this. You need to just trim this up about a quarter of an inch. To do that, have a sharp razor blade, work your way around gradually, and now it will match up to that factory depth. You definitely want to trim this. You don't want to leave it full length. What will happen is if it's too long, it will actually roll in on the speaker and crush into the surround of the speaker and that'll damage the speaker. For the back, you're going to do the same. The back panel is the exact same idea. If this thing is too thick or if there's a bar behind that runs across here, you just want to cut this to the appropriate length. Our window comes into the inside of the door. This guy mounted all the way into the back. We're not going to have that problem. Line it up with the center of the hole and just push it into place. And what you'll end up with is something that looks like this. One of the nice things of getting this on before you put the speaker in is that you'll know that you'll be able to get the speaker back out if you should ever have to service it. Like we said, we're doing a set of components in this door, and that means we have the crossover to contend with, this little cool box here. More and more speakers are breaking this into their dedicated pieces. They're doing away with the box, which as an installer is like, yeah, right? In this case, we don't have that. There's a couple different options as we can do. One of those is mounting the crossover in the vehicle somewhere. That can be tricky. And the reason for that is this guy right here, the door boot. This is what passes the wires from the inside of the car to the door. Depending on the car manufacturer, that can be doable or it cannot be doable. The reason why, some car manufacturers, the door clips in. It's a, it's a straight up plug that it just plugs into and there's no extra wires. Some cars, the plug is in the car. It just depends. There's a lot of scenarios. If it's something that you can't run through, then you're gonna be mounting that crossover somewhere in the door or somewhere in that door panel over there. It doesn't hurt to see if it's something you can do first, getting that wire through the door. And I can actually reach up into the dash and put my finger in there, so that's telling me that the plug is a little bit further back in the dash. For that, we're just gonna use our standard wire fish and see if I can fish this through. Wow, we just flossed that door. That means now what we'll do is we'll mount the crossover somewhere in the car. We'll just have to find a location to do it. We'll make a bracket, mount it into place. If we weren't so lucky, 
what would we have done? Now looking at this door panel, there's not a huge amount of options. We have this guy here, which really is just taking up space, but that gives us this. This crossover fits perfectly in here. But what we would have done is we would have made a bracket that allows us to mount this crossover right here, and then we would have ran the wires up through this channel, attaching them along the way to these screw points. What we get for that are these right here. It's a six channel waterproof connector, and we put this right next to where the switch panel is so that it can be unplugged. That way when they need to go and take the door panel off for service they don't have to mess with our crossover mount it doesn't fall out of the door it doesn't do anything silly it's permanently fixed into the door panel the dealership or anyone that has to work on it they don't have to mess with our work it keeps it nice and clean and out of the way like I said we don't have to worry about out this one back to the door panel for a minute and what we found is that this area here and these overlapping panels they like to which is really kind of annoying we had sound treatment now to prevent that and we've had a lot of success with it So looking at the sail panel with the tweeter mounted into it, the tweeter that's in here is a little bit smaller than the one we're going to do. We have to retain this factory look. We're not making sail panels here. He wants it mounted in from behind. It looks factory. The way they've designed this panel is that there's three clips holding it on as well as these three welded plastic points to get this apart. Now the tweeter, just to get it out, it is just held in place by a couple clips and then it will come out. You can see this guy here is a little bit smaller than our tweeter. That means ours is just not going to snap into place and be super simple. Thinking is, is I need to get these two pieces separated. See if it even fits in the hole, meaning that it lines up or if it's too big. To get these two apart, they plastic welded them together, so we're just gonna plastic weld them apart. Now once we get the two pieces apart, we have the mounting bracket and our tweeter is still a little too big for this hole. In fact, it's about the same size as this hole. But the real question is, does it marriage up to this hole? And to see that, we need to go ahead and pull this grill off. Bring our tweeter up from the back side. It actually fits perfect. Now we need to figure out a way to get this tweeter to suspend right there and also this to snap back in place. Let's see what this looks like when this is inside of here. And it mounts up flush with this internal lip. Let's start by making this hole as big as possible. Size of these tweeters, there's two little teeth that stick down. I want to draw them onto here so I know where they're at. I'm also thinking I can remove this outside here and bring this down about an eighth of an inch and my tweeter will snap right into place. Grinding away some of that to make room for this to snap in. Let's put it back into its little pod here. Snaps right in. Look at that. What I'm thinking we'll do is we'll add screws to where those factory weld points were so that we can take this apart if we need to. Now we don't have to worry about the tweeter twisting it all. Those two little pieces that stuck down and I groove those in so the tweeter just stays mounted in those little holes. And it's not glued in there so I don't have to worry about, you know, oh, we gotta break all this glue off. So it'll stay put. So what we'll use is a small quarter inch screw with a star locking washer on it. Now the last thing we want to do is put a clip on here so that like the factory, it just unplugs. Um, Once you're done soldering and you put your heat shrink on, you want to wait a couple minutes in order for this stuff to dry and become nice and hard before you put your tape over it. It's still kind of gooey and you don't need the two of them like sticking together or bending in some strange way. Now as far as the tape we're using, we use Tessa tape. There's two different types of Tessa tape. You have the interior fuzzy style and you have the exterior non-fuzzy style. One you can easily rip, the other one you have to cut with a pair of scissors. We live in Florida. This stuff here, this doesn't hold up this well. We primarily use the exterior Tessa tape on everything we do because it doesn't get all gummy and gooey. Put a zip tie in to hold the wire in place so that it doesn't get yanked out. And there we go. Tweeter's all set, factory mount, snap right back in place. We have the door back together. We were able to run in two new wires for our crossover. So we have a new mid-range wire in place here, all set and ready to plug into the speaker and we have the new tweeter wire here that we added our clip on so that if this needs to come off for any reason, it's still serviceable.
adjustable. The last step is to get that mid-range screwed in and get this door panel back on. The back of the door has all its sound treatment back on it. So that finishes up the process for the front doors. Because we've done this as ANC and previously we found it up behind the glove box, it seems like a good enough place to start on this dash assembly. Now they have this nice piece of painted material up here. We don't want to have anything happen to that, so we put some blue tape over it. There's a panel here that looks like it needs to be removed. We'll take our same panel tool and remove it. And the ANC module is exactly where I remember it. So located right up here below the airbag but above the glove box is the module. Now on these particular vehicles, in order to bypass it, all you have to do is unplug it. We don't want it to get plugged back in by accident, so we're actually going to move it out of the way and zip tie it to this harness here. If a mechanic or something like that starts working on the car, they don't go, oh, and click it in and then everything goes crazy. Now that we have the ANC sorted out, it's time to move on to get to the brain of the radio. We don't necessarily need to get to this because this is just a touch panel. We need to get behind the radio and get to the plug so we can do some testing. To do that, there's some side panels here that need to be removed. You have to pull out the push to start and then this whole panel will come out and unplug. Once we've gotten to the actual radio brain we can go ahead and plug these panels back in at this point we will be turning on and off the key because we need to do some sound testing one of the reasons why a normal radio will have such a hard time coming in here the radio is actually shaped to where it's facing down so normally these would be going into the dash and now they're not they're going straight up and down that's actually not the end of the world because some radios are becoming two pieces meaning the screen and the brain are two totally different parts in which case we can mount the screen up top and and the radio down below. What we just need is the part that talks to the car, which there are companies out there that are developing. But what I need out of this is the factory harness, the one that the speakers are in. That's the one we need in order to integrate our system. Located all the way in the back. Behind all this, there is a gray plug, that one right there. One of the nice things about this becoming more and more popular, meaning integrating into the factory radio, and those same companies that are coming up with solutions are coming up with harnesses for those solutions. What we have here is a T harness, one that'll plug into the radio and one that will plug into the factory harness and it gives us our speaker level output and then we can tie into these for our signal without having to get into the dash and cut that harness up. We don't want to do this, it's a brand new car. To use this, this comes with a bunch of wiring that we won't be using. We're not going to be using the product this attaches to. Once we validate all our testing, we'll go ahead and pull this all apart and just have the wires that we need. But for now, we're just going to get this plugged into the back of the radio, or in this case, the bottom of the radio. Now because the manufacturers really don't want us to do what we're doing to this car, they've gone ahead and made things increasingly difficult for us. One of the things that they've added into the mix is what's called load resistance. Load resistance is the speaker connected to the radio, it sees that as a load. When that load goes away, that channel shuts off because it feels there could be something wrong. In order to protect itself and not blow up, it just turns it off. The other side effect to that is, is that load also smooths out the sound of the amplifier. In some cases, when you don't have that load on there, the amplifier ramps up and can and cause the tweeters to make funny high frequency noises. So you have to be real careful there. There are ways to test for that and we're going to do that now. We also want to make sure that there is in fact no amplifier and that's going to be the first test we do. So let's head over to the toolbox and grab some tools. The first thing we want to grab is just a tone generator. What a tone generator is designed to do is just that. It creates a tone and we should hear it in the speakers. So that's telling us right away we have no amplifier. Now we want to grab the RTA. Now to perform this test, this RTA is connected to the driver's door that does not have any load resistance on it from any speaker. This one is connected to the passenger door, which is active right now. And what we want to do is see if there's any differences. Both left and right appear to be playing the exact same. We can look at our peak light indicators here and see if they match, and they do. We're also looking at the signal that's coming out of the radio. There's a huge hump here, dip here, dip here, and then some bass roll off through there. It's not the best signal I've ever seen, but then again, it's not the worst. We can EQ it and fix that. Now, one of the tests that we need to perform on the output of the radio is how much voltage is coming out of the radio that's going to be going into the input of our amplifier. 
that. This is a very important piece of information to know. You don't want to put too much voltage in. For example, if it will only take six volts of input and you're putting 10 volts of input, you're going to hurt the amplifier. To test for this, we're going to play a 1000 hertz test tone out of the radio. We're going to use our digital multimeter here, set to AC, turn it up and see what happens. Now make sure when you do this test, you have your speakers disconnected. So it's topping off between nine and three quarters and 10 volts, which is in the operating range of the amplifier we are going to put in. So we're good there. While we're testing the output voltage, another test we want to do is something called DC offset. DC offset is something that has become kind of the norm for turning on an amplifier when you're doing an install like this. There's a six volt DC output that comes from the radio when it turns on and the amplifier or high level or DSP or whatever it is you're using is designed to see that and turn itself on and and then when it goes away, it turns itself off. We want to test for that, because if it doesn't have it, then we need to find a different way to turn on our amplifier. You simply take your ground probe and attach it to negative. And then me personally, I like to use the signals positive output. I'll attach my red probe to that, set it to DC, and we'll turn the car on. And immediately we see voltage going up and it just stops somewhere right before or at six volts. Now as we can see the radio is on, but the audio is off. And this is where this gets tricky because a lot of things still pass through the audio section of the radio, such as Bluetooth navigation, which still has to function even though there is no source plane on the radio. We still see this current. Now we'll turn the car back off. And there we go, it drops out to nothing. Another thing that kind of freaks people out with DC offset, you can easily just like hit unlock on the key fob or pull up on the handle, and it'll wake the car up and turn on the DC offset because the radio is prepping itself to do something. When it doesn't see anything, then it'll go back to sleep. We get calls all the time for people going, dude, my amp never shuts off, my amp never shuts off. And I go, well, wait a minute, of course it shuts off. No, no, every time I open the door, it's on. So you say, do me a favor, shut the door, sit in the car, and then tell me if your amp shuts off. For this particular install, there's nothing too crazy that we have to do. It's just four channel output from the radio, which is what we were hoping for because it has the basic system. However, this could have got a lot more interesting if it would have had the amplified system and we would have had to do summing. Summing is where you take two speakers, such as a tweeter and a mid-range, and blend the two of them together to create one signal. There's some attenuation that needs to be done between them. Sometimes they do filtering between the two that can cause us heartache. We can test for that as well with this device here which is a phase summer that allows us to feed both the tweeter and the mid-range or whatever channels it is that we want to bring together and flip the switches on at the same time looking at the RTA and we can see what's going on see if there's any dips or if there's any bumps that may cause problems and that we'll have to address in the tune itself. We're not going to have those problems with this so it doesn't look like it needs any load resisting. Now we have a clear path how we're going to get signal out of the radio. What we need to do next figure out how we're going to mount the amplifier underneath this seat and get that built so we can get it into the car. This is the amplifier. As you can see, there's a nice shelf here. We want to bring this up high like that off of the floor so that this floor mat will still go back in and also that vent will still blow forward. There is plenty of room in which we can do that. So we're gonna take some measurements. We're gonna make a T-shape that goes across between these two and then goes forward. And is going to probably tongue into this area here and use that as the lock for the front mount of the amplifier. To make this amplifier mount, we're gonna make it out of ABS. ABS is strong and rigid. We're gonna use quarter inch. The basic shape we're going after is something that's gonna resemble this. I'm hoping to add in this little extra area here that's gonna go where the vent is. It's going to dip down here, go lower, then dip back up. And then the last thing we might do I don't know yet, is add a front panel to cover where the controls are on the amplifier. Now let's head over to the saw and cut some plastic. We need to draw our basic shape on this. ABS has this textured side on one side and a shiny flat side on the other. I like to draw my layout on the back side. We've already gone ahead and found our center point and also our two narrow spots. We need to add in the T's. These two areas right here, we do need to remove.
While we were over there cutting this out, we also went ahead and added a round over to this front lip here and all across this top. The reason why we went ahead and did it now before we actually get to our final shape is that this isn't gonna change here across the front or on the sides. And once the bend goes into this, we're not going to be able to router it. Now, as far as the height goes, we need to get it about a half inch. So we're gonna use this piece of Sintra as a shape, and then we'll use these two pieces to actually pinch and round it in. To heat up our corners, we simply just use a torch because we're actually going to be bending about an inch. And if we were to just put it on to the plexi bender, it wouldn't give us the double bend we need. Now we just want to kind of push it into place while holding the top down and then we wait because you know we have to wait for it to cool down. Now once it becomes rigid like that actually happens pretty fast it'll still be extremely hot but we can take it over and put water on it to cool it down. I'll we'll repeat the process on this other side. Now the next step is to remove the area that will allow this to tongue into where the air vent is. And that is this spot here and this spot here. And this is what we ended up with. We also went ahead and rounded this over as well and did a full round over on this side so that it will slide into place. Now let's take this into the car. So that's exactly what we're looking for. What we need to do now is drill out these holes here, make an indenture for this and that on both sides. That should work. You want to screw the bolts all the way into place to test fit this because if it's loose there could be play you want to make sure that this is your final product now we'll go ahead and slide the seat back see if it rubs on the amplifier and because we planned accordingly that light is the top of the amplifier we have about an inch of gap above the amplifier. So we took good measurements. Now we need to get this back out and wired up. Now speaking of wiring, there's a couple things we're doing differently that we didn't talk about this morning as far as the wiring goes. Because we've been able to run wires into the doors, we're gonna mount the crossovers inside like we did talk about. For that, we're going to make a mount up here and behind the glove box in this area. There's a lot of room up in here. Put both crossovers up in here and then run wires out to the speakers. Now one more thing I wanna do before we get to the wiring is I saw where this was sitting back there and he's got two kids and I am worried about them kicking this. We're going to make a panel that sits here. We're gonna put these style nut certs into here. These are gonna screw in and then this will screw into there and that will hold that up against the amplifier. And also you can unscrew it and screw it as many times as you like. So this amplifier is two inches tall. And we're gonna go all the way across. We'll just go 12. So I need 12 and a half by two inches. Now I want this right up against the amplifier because when these kids kick, I don't want this thing to go anywhere. I don't want it to break off. I screw these in. They have an Allen head input. We have a nice panel, nice and rigid. Kitties can kick the crap out of it. We've also sanded these flush so that they don't interfere with the floor mat. One of the things that's unique to this particular amplifier is that it has no fuses on it, which isn't all that unique per se. They give you this with these instructions telling you that this needs to be mounted back by the amplifier. So you need one under the hood and you need one back by the amplifier. Just in case you're one of those people that don't read the instructions, they make it abundantly clear that read those. What that means is that somewhere on this, we need to put this fuse holder. This is gonna be straight across here, so we don't really have that room. I don't wanna put it here. So looking at the car, it could mount right here below the amp board, something where the amp rises up like this. I have a little bit of room here so I can make a piece of plaque that comes off here at an L and this attaches to just like that. And then there's enough room here for the wire to come up and go into the amplifier. And this of course will go off into the car to go to the battery. So now we need to fabricate this little L bracket here. Now what I wanna do is put something underneath it to kind of get an idea of how high it needs to be so I can get my measurements. That's about the right height. So this is what I'm looking at, and I've gone ahead and round over these sides again, but not this, because this is gonna need to screw in. Because this is a longer piece and it needs to be very fine where the bend is, we're actually going to cut a 16th of an inch in here as a marker. Once hot, and there we go.
Now that we have the amplifier mounted, the fuse holder mounted, we're gonna do the final fit to make sure this all goes in the way it's supposed to, and then we'll start getting our wires attached. As you can see, the fuse holder's mounted over there. This kick panel will keep everyone out. We still have room up underneath. We can still get this out fairly simple. The seat will slide back, and when the seat's back, all you'll see is this right here. This amplifier has the ability to do high level input or low level input. It's a simple switch on the amplifier and it's done via the RCAs. There's no external input. What we found works best for us are these. They're made from Stinger. It's a pigtail RCA that has speaker wires on one end and a male RCA on the other. We can attach these to wiring and run them directly up into the dash. For this, we're also putting in a base knob. Power is gonna be on this side and go up the driver's side of the car. And then all the signal is gonna go out this way over to the passenger side of the car along with the subwire coming across. These are going to come up and go into the dash this way, so probably just straight over and turn. Power wire will loop around here, come and attach in here. The ground may follow it the same way and come down. 12 is first, ground is second. We might put them up on a vertical to bring them around into this. But regardless, let's go ahead and get some wire and start getting some stuff in. I'm gonna start from this side and work my way across that way. First thing here is the subwoofer wire. For that, we're gonna be running a 12 gauge wire that's going to go from here all the way into the trunk. So we're gonna need about 10 feet of 12 gauge. For all the wire we're gonna run through this install, it's all gonna be covered in either some form of sleeving or it's going to be insulated in some form of tape. It just gives it a more finished look and of course protects the wire. Because we need this to come out of the amplifier and immediately take a turn, we want to stagger the wire tips here. As you can see when you bend the wire like this, one immediately becomes longer than the other. We want to avoid that because then they don't go in properly. So we'll just shorten that one, make sure that they're both the same length now that they're turned. Because this type of terminal is a set screw and twist down. If you just put the raw wire in there it's going to tear the raw wire. We use our product called a ferrule and what it's designed to do is sleeve over the wire to protect that. And they have a tool that crimps it into place. Put some heat shrink over the ends. Now the reason we're putting this tape here is because now what we're going to do is we're going to drill zip tie holes extremely close to this so that this guy can get pulled in nice and tight and we don't want the drill to scratch it. because this is going to be a floating amp rack, we can put our zip tie heads, that's this bigger area here, on the bottom of the amp rack because there's gonna be nothing there to hit them. Cut them flush using a set of flush cutters, otherwise they will hurt you. Anytime you have a fuse holder that comes in a kit, always tighten the fuse. You don't know if the guy tightened it up, he might have been having a bad day at the factory, so make sure you tighten it. If it's loose, it's going to vibrate around and it's going to burn the wire up. Now just like the smaller wire, we have a ferrule for it. And then when we add our heat shrink, we have custom heat shrink made that has our logo on it. And of course, they're all the right colors so that people know who put it in. Once it's cooled to the touch, tighten it down. And we went ahead and also made up the ground version. So we'll do the same thing. This line here is where the wire has to stop. So I'm thinking that if I stack them on top of one another, they'll both do the turn here. I might notch this right here so that the wire turns better, but let's get this front half done first. Both wires are snaking around, stacked on top of one another, keeps that footprint small, and then they're looping around, attaching it here. The ground, when it loops around, it stacks on top of these and uses that same zip tie. So now they're both going to catch up with one another and go into the car. We put heat shrink on the ends of all our RCAs so we know which channel is which. We use the standard color, purple, green, gray, white. To get signal from the radio to these RCAs, we're gonna use a product called Speedwire. It's a nine conductor wire that has the same colors that we have here, and it also has remote turn on. Now, even though we're not going to be using the remote turn on in this installation, we are gonna go ahead and hook it up so that if something is to happen, we will have it already pre-wired in the amplifier. We just need to solder in our like pairs, so white to white, gray to gray. The other thing that makes this very nice doing it this way, when we were doing our testing, 
there's a plug that's on the harness we're gonna be using to allow you to plug in your speakers. That plug, we can remove from the harness and attach to our speed wire. That will allow us to just simply plug in our speed wire behind the radio. We won't have to do any soldering or tight connection there. So I took a quick moment to go look at the car to figure out which way I wanted to route these wires if I wanted to come this way or if I wanted to come this way and turn like this. And I've decided that this would be the best course. So now we're gonna bring this wire around and it will also follow suit like that. And then our speaker wires will do the same thing. They'll come down this center path right here. Doing that, we're gonna be using these holes, the same holes we're gonna be using for this. So they're gonna be sharing a hole. So when you do that, you have to be real careful on where the head goes. On the back here, we've already done that. Where the moat turn on, runs next to the subwire. And you notice the way the two heads are. You have to make sure that they keep going in that same direction. Could drill a hole here if we wanted and lock in place and just keep going this way and have no issues. If we have to go this way, you always have to start like this and then move your way out. You'd remove these and replace them. We have a white and gray 16 gauge that we've covered in shielding. Now we're gonna apply the ferrules to the end as well as color-coded heat shrink to match the corner of the car that it's going. Putting the speaker wire in, we don't want to over tighten it. We just want to lock it in place so like as soon as it hits, stop there because we're still going to have to do our gain adjustment on this and we have to take our speaker wires off to do that. And there we have it. The amplifier is all set and ready to get installed the car. One of the things to think about when you are putting the zip ties in place, where we soldered these wires together here, we wanna make sure we don't put a zip tie over that solder joint. Put it before it, put it after it, don't put it at the solder point. You don't wanna crush that down tight with a zip tie. Now one of the things I'm told unique is about our installs is the way we actually run wires. I build the amplifier amp rack, put it in the car, and run my wires out to everything in the car. I know a lot of installers will run the wires to a central location, sit in a very uncomfortable place for many hours and wire it up. When I was doing all my custom fabrication, it was easier to put the amplifiers in after you'd cover the pieces and build out as you go so you could, like Legos, drop these pieces into the vehicle with the product already on it, wire zip tied up. That has evolved on into what we're doing now where we're making these complex shapes to mount amplifiers in the vehicle, zip tying the wires into location and getting it nice and pretty on the bench and then running them forward into the car. One of the nice side effects is we spend less time in the vehicle because we're doing all the work here on the bench. Starting on a rear seat disassembly, especially where you're planning on camping out in there for a while, doing sound treatment, it's best practice to just go ahead and remove the whole back seat, top and bottom. Even if it folds down, remove it. You don't want to sit on the back of the seat. The seats aren't made all that great. These hinges aren't super strong. They're not made for someone to be sitting on them. And it's a simple enough task of just removing them. It's like three bolts in this car. Once removed, you can sit back here all you want. Now, if you're worried about your knees, because sometimes these back areas are sharp, use a moving cloth put down here on the bottom and you won't have to worry about that. This Honda is nice enough to actually already have a cloth floor. Thank you, Honda. Unlike the front speaker, the rear speaker here is a tad bit thinner. For this, we only need to use one layer of half inch to get the desired height that we wanted. Because if you push the foam down, it's about a half inch. Now, just like the front, we're also gonna put our fast rings around the outside. We're just obviously we can't do anything for the backside. Now one tip when putting in your sound treatment. Don't cover up the factory wiring. Pull it out and clip it back into place. This stuff still has to be serviced after we're done playing with it. We need to make sure that it's capable of doing that. Don't cover up any holes. Make sure you leave areas where if there's a clip, you can clip it back in, just like here. And then while you're doing it, just kind of hit the surface. 
Make sure what you're doing is actually making a difference. This is only half of the sound treatment we're doing to this. We're also going to be doing the piece of plastic that goes over it. And for that, we'll be using a different style. It's gonna have a foam backing along with the butyl. We've added in our pads to this to make this a lot more rigid so it's not gonna vibrate. And then we've added in our fast rings and cut them to length with the rear deck when it goes back on. All that acoustic energy will be forced up through the rear deck. And if you're somebody that likes rear fill, you're gonna be really happy. So even though we don't build boxes here in the actual install bay, we do have a facility that builds the boxes for us. We just have to send them a blueprint of what we want and they'll go ahead and build it. So we have to still figure out what we want the box to look like, how much airspace we want and all the stuff that goes into actual the box what i like to do is draw a basic outline of what i want the box to look like it's a downfiring box for a subwoofer it's a very common application that we do here because we have a lot of people like this gentleman that want cargo space and they have stuff to put in their cars we also do a lot of jeeps and these work really well in jeeps as well so we have a basic shape what we need to do now is just add in the numbers so that this box can be built for us what we're trying to do is hit the target one cubic foot of air space for this woofer but it's just a matter of doing the math we want the box to be about 24 25 inches long we don't want it to get too wide here I'm thinking max of 15 and a half and now we just need to figure out how high it can be I also like to have a minimum of two inches on my legs on the bottom of the box that way we can add in plastic risers when they're down firing I like to put plastic risers on the bottom of the box especially like in Jeeps or something like that where it could possibly get wet I don't want them to soak up the water that's gonna give me roughly five and a half, which is what my target number was. Now we know what we can write in on this so that we have the measurements that they can take and build off of this. Now what I'll do is I'll take a picture of this, send it over to our guy, he'll build the box for me and deliver it to me by the end of the day. Now we have to mount the sub knob. Now this is a big sub knob. It's almost as big as like a DRC DSP controller. Now a customer has criteria as far as what we can do with this. He wants to be able to access it, but he doesn't want to modify any of the existing panels. Like there was one spot behind the cup holders that it could have gone so that left us one other spot for it which is here in the pocket below the factory USB it's not in too deep so you still have access to it looking at the pocket it looks like it this top piece comes off after you remove these two screws so let's give it a go So now that we have it apart, and I'm looking at this, and this is an okay position for it, but this area up here looks way more appealing. But the USB's here. What I think we might be able to do is move the USB down to here. Now the only problem with doing that is the way that this USB integrates in with the car. It is super tight. It was very hard to get this out of here. So we'd have to come up with a way that makes this easy to get to. I think by moving it back an inch might make it okay, but we will have to cut a tunnel in here to do it so that we can fish the wire through, pull it out the front, and snap this in all at once. I'm thinking what I can do is take the thicker one inch plastic that we have and just tunnel in it a groove that this whole piece will assemble itself into. So we have this thicker stuff here, which if I hold it up to it, it's a little bit bigger, which is perfect. Now I could use a router to just tunnel a groove into here, but it's gonna be L-shaped on either side and I feel the table saw would be more appropriate for that. So we've made the tunnel wide enough to fit in, but now we have this top portion that we have to cut grooves for. So we have it fitting in perfect. Now what we need to do is cut the rear to length so that it'll snug up in there. Fits in there pretty good. I think I just need to shave an eighth of an inch here off at the back because I want it to tuck up in there a little bit. That gets us right in there. What I want to do is I want to finish off the front because I need this to snap into place. I can't just attach it like this and then put the plug in while this is assembled. I need to pull the plug through and then have it clip in. That's the only way that this is gonna work. So I'm gonna cut a face out of eighth inch and attach it to this. What we want to make sure that this does is locks in place but still comes out because to service this, you're gonna have to pop it off here from the front. To use a zip tie to smear the glue around and get it all in all the little nooks and crannies. Now that the glue is dried, I'm gonna take it over to the router. 
this top piece here, I'll just take it over to the sander and sand it flush with this. There's our piece. I went ahead and sanded this whole area smooth and we'll apply some color dye to it so that it's black like this. While that paint is drying, we'll go ahead and get this hole cut out. For that, we'll start by covering it with blue tape. We'll take our grease pencil and mark the area that the old mount was in so we know what we have to cover. We're going to cut this hole out. Nice and flush, snaps right into place. Finish this up, let's go ahead and get our USB mounted back in place. Put the tape on here so that I have a guide for where I'm going to drill my holes to screw this in. Now because I won't be gluing this in place, I'm gonna be using this Tessa double-sided tape. It's super thin and it's super sticky and we use it anytime we have to tape plastic together. So the only thing we have left to do is cut a groove in here for us to drop the wire into. It's like it was made to be there. Very cool. All right, I'm gonna get this put back together. Placement of the fuse holder underneath the hood is crucial when installing any form of 12 volt product. Your motor has to be still serviceable, meaning you have to be able to get to all these, you have to work on the engine, you have to be able to take the battery out of the car. We mount all our fuse holders using quarter inch ABS somewhere in the area of the battery. Hondas aren't the most trickiest because they usually have room around their batteries and they have a long battery mount. That means we can make a ABS panel that's gonna put the fuse holder right in this area here. Also, it makes this fuse holder unique. I like to use it is the base comes off. That means that they can remove the panel we're putting in and set this aside if they need to or move it over to the side Why they need to do any work on the battery. So here's the shape that we've come up with. We'll put a washer onto the battery, then the piece of ABS, another washer, tighten it down into place. See it clears everything we need it to clear. Just get our short power wire run into here. We like to use red sleeving between the fuse holder and the battery to clearly indicate where our fuse is. It's time to figure out where these crossovers are gonna go. And as I said earlier, they're gonna go somewhere in the glow box. And Fernando's been looking at it and he's given me a couple ideas. And we were concentrating over here in the corner, like trying to build something. And that's a good idea, but then I laid on my back and I looked up and there's a ton of room looking up. And the really nice thing too is that the bolts that hold the ANC mic in is a wonderful place that we can use to actually screw in our bracket to. What we're thinking is we're gonna make a shape similar to that of what we just made for underneath the hood at the battery. We do have to notch one side to clear the air vent, but once that's in, we'll make the L shape here and we'll bend this a little bit so that it'll go up in place. And then we can use the ANC bolts to attach our cross crossover mount, that way it's nice and secure in the dash. Then we'll sit like this on the panel. What I need to do now is cut two grooves here and here so that this will slide in between the ANC module and the mounting bracket. Final test. Yeah, oh, that's cool. Here, take a look. The two bolts here for the module, bent piece of ABS goes in. We'll run the wires down and attach it to this existing harness right here. I love it when a plan comes together. Since I'm over here in the dash, there's one piece that I still need to put together, and that's the harness that we have plugged in right now, that T harness. I need to unplug it, strip off all the wiring, and make that cleaned up so that we can use it for this application. Now let's head over to the bench. Installing right now is definitely a lot different than when I started. Back then you just had catalogs and you'd look through catalogs and you'd find parts and every now and then you'd get a phone call from somebody that sold parts. It's not like that anymore. Nowadays you spend 
tons of time searching the internet for parts so that you don't have to damage factory parts. Case in point, this nice T-Hunters right here. Now this manufacturer doesn't intend us to do what we're doing with it, but that's okay. All we want is these two ends right here. That's it, that's all we need. We'll figure out the rest on our own. I was buying harnesses from Europe because they needed them for Bluetooth. It's the same harness. There again, I just need the wires. So we were bringing in European harnesses for the American cars so that we could integrate in and not have to cut the harness. Luckily for us, the owner of the store is down with doing that. He sees value in it and he can express that to the customers. Especially on something like this, it's a 2019. You definitely don't want to start cutting harnesses in this car. Once we remove their power wiring, we're going to go ahead and cut this and reassemble it. And we'll repeat that on all these wires that had their crimps on them. When we were talking earlier, we were gonna be able to add the clip that was in the car to the speed wire. So when we were doing testing, we had these two clipped together like this. This is the harness I wanna remove and attach to it. To do that, I will use my Delphi depinning tool. And for this, it's pretty simple. There's just a groove you just pop in, push, and it comes right out. Now on this end is a Y. You have what went off to the plug and you have what would have allowed you to loop it through. I want to keep this long end and reattach this onto here because in the dash it's extremely tight and I want to make sure my connection has plenty of room to get around. To do that, I'm going to remove the heat shrink so I can cut these off cleanly. I'll add some solder to that joint and I'll put a fresh piece of heat shrink over it. And of course, I'm gonna do it to the rest of them. All set and ready to go. We'll pull this off, cut these ends off of here. We'll put it into our shrink wrap bowl so we know where it's at. Now I'm gonna go ahead and go plug this back into the car and snake this over to where I can get to it so I can attach my speed wire to it. I got the radio harness plugged back in and I was able to run the wire for the speakers all the way over here into the glove box. So the next step is to flip this seat up and finally get this amplifier in place so we can finish running these wires. The amplifier is in place and the wires are all ran. Power wire went up the center console along with the base knob wire. This is the base knob wire zip tied in. The ground is also located in the center console. We retained a factory ground point for that. Power wire is this braiding along over here that is zip tied into the main wiring harness and then goes up through the firewall. The main wire comes through a grommeted hole in the firewall following that main harness and then making the turn into the firewall. Comes through the firewall, lines up underneath this main harness here. You can start to see it just there. Comes around, zip ties into place, and terminates at the battery. As far as the other side goes, all our speaker wires and signal wires are coming along here into the harness, this plastic piece right here. They run along and then they come out and stop right here is where our speaker wires are located. These are going to attach along with these to our crossover network. And then this is the speed wire. We just need to add the other plug so that we can plug it in. Rear speaker and subwoofer wires are running towards the back, which we'll get to in a little bit. Along with the box being down fired, easy out of the way, he also wants it easy removable and he wants all of it removable. He also wants to take the wire out of the car. He wants us to put a speaker cup in the trunk here so that he can put his wires in and take the whole thing out. We're going to mount this somewhere over here in the side. To do that we need to make a whole back housing so that this isn't just you know we don't want it to pull out. So we have our mobile solutions template two and three quarters. Plan is to router out this shape and then put a backer on it. Well, you know what? Let's just head over to the router and I'll show you what I plan on doing. You want to make sure that when this goes in, these beaker slide on terminals aren't going to touch anything. So this is about the right size here. The first thing I want to do is transfer this onto this and then I'll make my circle. I screwed in the four screws so that I can make a center mark because on the template it actually has the center markings for it. So the last thing I want to do is put a back on this so that it's fully encapsulated. For that I'm just going to use some eighth inch that we have. I like to use the zip tie to spread the glue around. That should be enough of a gap so they can get the 12 gauge behind it. The hole is cut in the side. We just need to solder this guy into place. So 
So the box is in exactly what we wanted. We went ahead and added a brace. Forgot to include that in the drawing. So we put one on both sides. We have a dual four ohm subwoofer here and we need a two ohm load at the amplifier. We're gonna run two 16 gauge over to the subwoofer. And what we use this for is to hold our speaker cup while we're soldering onto it. Slide it in a place, tip it just the way we like it. I also like to add a layer of tape on the inside, more for cushion than anything else, just in case someone grabs the box and starts shaking it. I don't want these wires all flapping around inside of the box. Nice and padded. Now the reason why I use two different color wires, it's just a mental thing. I feel like they should be two different color wires. I think if you look at it, you'll know you have a clear left or a clear right. Especially on some of these woofers here, where they'll have like a lead here, here, here. It just makes it easier. The last thing we want to do to this enclosure is add in a set of half inch plastic risers to the bottom. The last piece of the puzzle is the subwoofer wire that's going to go from the side here to the box. What we've done is we have put our logo heat shrink on it logo on top that way when you put it in the logo is always on the top and that'll make sure that you get the positive and negative correctly and then we'll put it into the box and there again on this side logo on top and he has what he asked for we finished up the wiring in the back we color coded them and we added clips so that they can be disconnected if need be we also finished all the wiring in behind the glove box we have our connection made for our speed wire and all the crossovers are mounted and zip tied into place. He has kids and one of his concerns was the kids ruining it. This is with the panel installed. Go ahead and slide the seat back. And now when the kids are in here, they're not gonna damage it at all. And you still have all that air travel. But now that the amp wires are all ran, I want to get this center console back together. Now me personally, I'm anxious to get this USB into place and the base not plugged in. And one of the reasons why it is so difficult in this car is that that USB wire is super short. Barely comes into the pocket, let alone far enough to move anywhere really cool. So as you can see here, this is the farthest this comes out. You have to like snake it into place as you're sliding this back into the dash. I went ahead and put one screw in. Now I'm gonna snap the piece on and slide it all back into place. Success, it snapped right into play. Now we're moving on to the next step, which is the after test. I Meaning we did the pre-test, we did the install. Now we do the after test, where we go ahead and we do all our battery of tests to make sure everything is functioning the way we want it to. And then we move on from that to the actual tuning of the car. First test that we perform right out of the get-go is the polarity test. All right, so the bottom one is green, green, red. And the top one is green, green, red also. All right, we got green, green, red. Perfect. When testing the rear speaker, little trick, you can actually come up from underneath and it should flash the opposite. Perfect. Obviously it's gonna do that because this is positive movement, that's negative movement. And it's sometimes a little bit easier to do it from the trunk side. All right, we got green, green, red. Last speaker. All right, we got green, green, red. So that means that we got it right. High five, Fernando. But that's not the end of the road as far as testing goes. At this point, we move on to a much more basic test, the four corners. We just wanna make sure that we got all four corners right. However, we're not gonna do that yet because we're gonna plug the amplifier in. The DSP software in this amplifier allows us to test the outputs before we start to tune to make sure everything's right. So we're gonna skip that step. We're gonna make sure that the bass min treble in the radio, if it has it, is all set to flat. All right, we're on flat there. We'll check our balance and fader, make sure it's set to flat. What we want to do is plug in in our laptop you power up a dsp dsp amp or anything like that for the first time it's always going to want to do a software update let it do it you definitely don't want to mess around with something that's not up to date it will create all kinds of problems for you firmware update successful select okay every dsp every dsp amp is going to ask you to configure it configure it is the process it takes to direct the sound that's coming into the amplifier to the outputs of the amplifier every dsp software does it a little bit differently we try to download 
download and play with as many DSP softwares as we can get our hands on because we don't know what the customer is going to walk in the door with and we want to be prepared for that. For this particular amplifier, it's asking me the question of fader on, fader off. We want fader on, we're doing rear speakers and where I'm going to be getting the subwoofer from. Now we looked at both the front and rear on the RTA and they were the same. On this page, this is where it's going to allow us to identify the speakers. It makes a toning sound. This driver's front? Yes. There should be three. Yes. That should be the four. Four, yep. This should be two. Okay. Yep. I really like this feature because it allows us to identify what the amplifier is seeing right away. The next piece of information this is asking for is that time alignment. Those measurements we got at the beginning of this video. This could be the hard part depending on the DSP that you're working with. You really have to read the owner's manual on this one depending on the DSP. Some DSPs will do the calculations for you so I can just type in my inches and it will do the conversion from inches to milliseconds. Some DSP processors want you to zero out meaning take and subtract the farthest one from each one of them giving you a smaller number and then you enter that number in some of them actually want you to figure out the milliseconds so this is one of those things where figuring out the DSP does take a little bit of time this one all we do is have to enter in the numbers because we're not doing a active system we're doing a passive system we want to use the measurement from the mid base in the door and not the tweeter however there are certain situations where we actually actually flip that and go in and add the tweeter because it will sound better and boom we're ready the next thing we're gonna do is see where the radio distorts at to do that we're gonna use our SMD DD1 we're gonna play a thousand Hertz 0 DB test track and we're just gonna start turning it up and seeing what happens the gains in the amplifier are turned all the way down in the software we have signal oh we got a red light red light is bad red light is gone turn it up one turn it down one more all right, where are we at? 35. So that means that radio maxes out at 35. So anything above that, it's gonna start to break up a little bit. For this amplifier, the gains are adjusted through the DSP. We just wanted to find out first where the radio is gonna break apart. So while we're doing our, our next test, which is gonna be using pink noise in order to set up the DSP in the amplifier, which is these guys here. So we're gonna be using a DMRTA in the car, microphone up because he's a really tall guy, and that's where his head was. And then this laptop will be controlling the software for the DSP amplifier. This is what we're looking at coming out of the speakers right now. And specifically, this is the driver's front speaker with no EQ applied. What we wanna to try to do is kind of smooth this out a little bit. This seems kind of naturally high here. We kind of want to bring that down, take care of this little bump right here. And how we're going to do that is by adjusting this. This is a graphic equalizer, which means there's 31 bands, there's 31 channels, raise and lower accordingly. This is not a parametric, so we will not have the ability to adjust Q and make fewer measurements. This one's going to take a little bit longer. When looking at the DMRT, I do like to switch it out to one sixth scale. It makes it a little bit finer. You can see these bumps a little more clear clear best practices when doing DSP is to gain down and not up. That way you're not introducing noise. You're not boosting. So cut instead of boost is another way of saying it. Now when setting the DSP, I like to do driver's front with and without subwoofer. Then I like to do passenger front with and without subwoofer, turning it on and off. And one of the cool features about the DMRTA is it gives you the ability to ghost in a preset. I can look at my ghosted image of channel one here. Now I can play two. I can play my passenger side now and compare the two images together. Great looking at these computers and, and being able to do all this. It's a wonderful feeling. But ears on it are the, the ticket. I like what I see there. I wanna hear it now and I wanna make some adjustments from there. So I'm gonna hop in, play some music. I know, right? Now when I tune a car, I have a specific song that I play every time. And we've used this to tune hundreds of cars. And I know what it sounds like. And I don't like the song anymore, but I play it because I know what it sounds like. single point in the center of your sound stage. And after an extended period of playtime, whatever it takes, and you're finally happy, you can deliver it to the customer. All right, it's reveal time. Let's head outside and show him his new system. So 
So here's all your empty boxes. Uh, if you don't want to take them with you, we do have a dumpster over there. Uh, uh, that's entirely up to you. Here's all your old speakers. So what you wanted was a plug here so yes. that you can remove the whole thing. So what we built is it's an actual, it's not just that screwed into the side. We built a whole casing so that it's like a, like a little box on the back of it, like like a power outlet. Okay, yes. On the back of it, speaker wire, wire comes down in the top. It's all soldered in there together. So it's it's, yeah, but it's, it's not going anywhere. You don't have to worry about it smacking in anything. Yeah, sure. yeah. Now what we did is gray side comes here, white side goes there, okay. and they're color coded obviously. And if the logo is facing up, then you're going the right direction. Sounds good. So we made this ABS panel here. This bolt here on the top is actually a secondary bolt. So when you pull this off, this whole thing will come off, but the battery's bolt is still there. So it's, there's two bolts and washers. But if you just need to service something, this actually just pops off. So if they need to get into something like that, or if they need to take this off to get down to there, they don't actually have to pull the fuse holder out. They can leave it attached and remove this bracket. So it makes it kind of nice. And it just snaps back into place. So hop in there and take a look. So what we did, we went ahead and made a suspended amp mount here. So it, you still can put the floor mat in, yeah. you still get your uh, temp, you know, the air will still blow in from underneath the seat. But then we made this panel here, that is riveted into place. So you can actually pull these screws out, do any adjustment, screw the panel back in. Um, and then we sand the bottoms flush in case the little fingers get up underneath there, they won't yeah. cut themselves. And it, we put it flush up against the amplifier so they can just sit there and kick this all they want. That's it's not gonna hurt anything. And then there is a secondary fuse located here that Kicker requires us to install in these particular amplifiers. Okay. And that cover just pops off if need be. Right. As you can see the wiring here, everything is color coded. So you know you have your white, which is driver pass. We use the standard, you know, wire colors that have been established forever and ever. So that if you ever did have to take it somewhere to have them look at it, they should be able to clearly figure out what the heck is going on. Um, if you do need to get in the amplifier for the DSP section, the USB for it is located behind the panel. All right. Just pull those three out, and you're good to go. So the one thing about this amplifier is that it has that really big subwoofer volume control because it's a whole control center. And we were going to put it in this pocket because we didn't want to cut this up at all. And we were going to mount it down low here. Well, we changed it up a little bit. You had the factory USB right here. We actually made a whole new mounting for it wow. and mounted it here. And we put this up here where you can get to it and it's much easier to use. Absolutely. And the nice thing was is you wanted to make sure you retained as much of this pocket as possible. Mm -hmm. So now you do. You excited? You want to hear it? Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to do is we're going to play some of my music first, and then we'll switch to your music. Does it sound like your little nine balls rolling all over the front <laughs> yeah. of your dash? <laughs> Something that, uh, it could be a bad day if that, the stereo wasn't on those hearing that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and play some of your right. stuff and make sure it does what it wants to. Absolutely. Uh... You keep seeing me play with this guy here. Yes. So let me explain to you what's going on and what I'm, what I'm doing. Depending on the type of music you listen to, the default screen is always going to be gain. Okay. It's a pretty way of saying level. It's not really gain as per se like a gain on an amplifier. But I guess they figure since no one understands level, they'll just call it gain and everyone will think it's volume. So this indicator, obviously low, high. Yeah. Next is going to be boost. Now boost, center frequency, and width are three things that play hand in hand with one another. Yeah. Boost is the overall um, amount of effect that it's giving you on the center frequency, which is obviously the lower here to higher. Gotcha. And what the idea behind this is in your car, if you looked at the output of this factory radio on an RTA, it goes from high frequency to low frequency and it goes yay, 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 yay down. So it has a steep roll off starting at about 60 hertz Ooh. and just goes. <whistles> so when it's at 30 hertz, there's pretty much no sound coming out of it. That's why this feature in this amplifier is awesome because it helps to fix that. Uh, because it's designed to be a bass restoration device and when you're feeding it no bass That's what it's made to do is actually bring that bass back. So frequency The lower it is the more it will 
you know, it goes towards low frequency, the higher, the higher frequency. In this case, you're probably going to be using it in the lower frequency because you're wanting to bring those back. And then width is the next one. Oh, I'm sorry. Width is the next one. If you see a dot here, see a dot here. So what it's doing is it's doing this. So when you put them close together, that narrows the width. So if you're listening to something like a modern song that has a plenty of bass in it, you want your width to be narrow because there's tons of bass. You don't really need to have bass boost in it. When you're listening to something like Hey Jude, where there is no bass, by increasing the width, what you're doing is you're grabbing from frequencies to the left of right of the center frequency and bringing back in that fullness sound. That's why when you first started playing the song and the drum came in, I went over here and adjusted that, and all of a sudden you were like, oh, hey, there's bass. It's, it's, it's weird. It's not supposed to be there. So that's what that'll do for you. Two things. One, uh, behind the glove box here is the ANC module, which you probably know because you're a Honda guy. No? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we've unplugged that. Okay. Um, this is also where we mounted the crossovers. So we made a giant ABS panel that mounts up into the dash behind there. So okay. if you ever pull the glove box out, they're tucked up in behind between here and the airbag is the crossovers. Right. Secondly, the only other thing that is attached to the car is the T-harness we put in. Okay. We ran all new speaker wires into the doors. We ran all new speaker wires to the rear. So the only thing we're tapped into is the battery and we have a plug Behind the glove box, there again, if you pull up the glove box right here, okay. there's a plug that unplugs, and you can unplug all eight of our speaker wires. All right. And that's all that's connected to the car. All right, and how'd you get the power to the back, uh, into the under seat? Did you put a grommet in, or? Yeah, there's a grommet underneath the firewall over there, yeah. and then we put um, a 3 amp strip cock around the hole to, you know, waterproof it. Yeah. We drilled our own hole. We're not going through any factory harnesses okay. there, so we don't have to worry about so power runs. There. Power runs across, comes up the center console here. It's zip tied to the main harness. Right. Comes underneath the seat and attaches here. There's a factory ground point located right underneath this cup holder. Okay. So we went ahead and used that for our ground. So we didn't actually drill into the car to make any ground points. Sounds good. Really, that's about it. I mean, honestly, the most obtrusive thing we did was mount this base knob. I like what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right. Well, that's all I got Thank for you. you. Thanks for uh, making the trip and uh, spending the time by the pool for a couple days. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure it was terrible. <laughs>